Welcome to Novelist Spotlight. This is Mike Consul, your host. In addition to being the host of this podcast and interviewing novelists, I am a novelist myself. I have two published novels. I hope you will buy them. I hope you will read them. And I hope you will thoroughly enjoy them. My latest is titled Family Recipes, a novel about Italian culture, Catholic guilt, and the culinary crime of the century. My previous novel is titled Hardwood, a novel about college basketball and other games young men play. And that story deals with issues ranging from depression and racism to sex, religion, and university politics. Both of those novels are listed in the episode notes. Now, on with our program. This is Mike Consul. Welcome to the episode. In the spotlight is Anna Hoagland. Anna has made some uh, headlines. She's gotten a lot of attention for her debut novel called The Long Answer. That's the first of what I trust, given her age and her commitment, that's going to be many novels coming along in the future. We'll talk to her a little bit about what she, what's on deck for her. Um, her her current book, as I mentioned, was is The Long Answer. And uh, just in a capsule, a woman considers pregnancy, motherhood, and the nature of female relationships in the book. She's, again, gotten a lot of attention for this. Anna, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you taking the time. And I know because I've done some background research on you that this could have easily been, this book, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but this book, which dives into pregnancy, motherhood, I think you get into um, Dobbs and Roe v. Wade and all that. Um, it actually could have been a memoir. It's, it's very much a memoir. I think that you decided to go the route of auto fiction. Is that is that correct? Well, there's a lot that is very fictionalized, um, both with the Anna character. I mean, she does share my name and a couple of things we have in common. Um, you know, super. Does your sister things. share your name too? I mean, is that your sister's name as well? Oh no, everyone, every every character's name is fictionalized. Is fictionalized if, except yours. Yeah. Okay, except for mine. Yeah. Um. So there are parts of the novel that maybe could be seen as memoir. Um. I kind of hold the key, you know, the code of of uh, the legend, I guess, of what is more fictionalized and less fictionalized. But I don't know that there's any page that is completely untouched, you know, by some kind of fictionalizing wand. So it, it isn't, it wouldn't pass any kind of, you know, is this real enough to be a memoir test? It's always been very much a novel to me. Um, and I, I mean, an auto fictional novel. So obviously there are parts of it that are, you know, at least have the illusion and often it's a illusion based in truth that it is um, not, uh, you know, it is closer to reality, um, but it never is exactly as I remember things or exactly as I am wanting to tell. The story is never totally true. Um, I love having that liberty of being able to veer away from reality whenever I feel like it. And memoirs right. don't have that, um, aren't able to do that as as much. So they're a little more constrained. And whenever I feel constrained, I feel like I want to break it. Yeah, something. isn't that what <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, writing is supposed to be about freedom, and I think when and uh, being a lifelong journalist myself, I, there's always that constraint of uh, if you need to deal with the facts and whatnot. But there's the freedom in fiction writing that, uh, like you say, as soon as you start to feel constricted, you you want to to be able to break out of that. How long have you wanted to be a writer? I a have one. Well, it's a little bit of a spotty answer because it was the first thing I wanted to be when I was a young child. Um, or I, I didn't quite know what a novelist was, but I knew I wanted to write and I wanted to write fiction. And I wrote a lot of terrible poet, like little kid poetry and songs and things. Um, so I knew that I wanted to do that from a very young age, but it really, I lost sight of it for quite a few years, um, like all through high school and college and even into grad school. I went to grad school for social work first and then my MFA second. So that's about 10 to 15 years where I I wasn't writing hardly at all fiction anyway. And I thought I wanted to be a lawyer and then I changed course to become a therapist, which I, I still am. Um, You're a practicing therapist. You have a private practice. 
you deal mainly with, uh, or you were, I don't know if you still are dealing primarily with uh, eating disorders. Well, I took a break from my practice for about six months around when the book came out to uh, not just actually, it kind of was coincidence that the book came out around that time. Um, it was mostly other life factors that contributed to it, but I just reopened it like yesterday. I literally sent out, started sending out emails and putting my psychology today back up uh, this week. So that is a I took a little break, but it's coming back. Um, and it is true that I did mostly eating disorder focus. Um, I had a couple of years of training pretty much just in that area um, after my master's and most of my private practice has been that. However, did you, did you pick... I'm moving into more of a generalist space when I come okay. back from my break. Yeah. I see. So did you go to eating disorders because you ever had an eating disorder? I did have an eating disorder and that was definitely part of the draw was to understand what that was about for myself. And to be honest, like learning some therapeutic techniques and interventions that I didn't receive when I was going through that. And so I was, I found it really, really humbling to realize that I had more work to do than I realized when I started doing eating disorder work. Um, but it was the most healing thing for me to be doing that. You know, you have to be in a certain place to be able to do that work at all. Um, Is so that an issue you vanquish now? I would say that, yes, the, the combination of being an eating disorder specialist for many years and pregnancy, um, and pregnancy loss and becoming a mother has made me feel like it really is in the rear view now. So you don't struggle with it. It's it's past you. It's not like drinking where an alcoholic, you always call yourself an alcoholic when you're an alcoholic because, because it's, a, it's a lifelong struggle. You can't go back to it ever. Yeah, um, that's a difference. And I know that's not true, you know, for everyone with substance, but I know that's kind of the, the way it's most commonly talked about. That is a that is a slight difference in how we would talk about eating disorder. Or I mean, some people definitely say like, you will have it, you always have it. And that just isn't That has true. not been your experience though. Yeah. I mean, some people, some people do, of course, but a lot of people don't. It is something that you can recover from. I'm just curious, uh, did you ever see a man uh, with an eating disorder or is it strictly, I, I, I think it's commonly thought of as a woman's disorder where men have something completely different, like guys in the weight room who always see themselves as skinny and they keep taking steroids and building their body bigger because they always feel that they're thin. Well, a woman never feels thin if she's got an eating disorder oftentimes. But did you ever see a male patient in there? Oh, many. Yeah. Did I saw you? Okay. a lot so of men, a lot of non-binary, a lot of trans, mostly women um, for sure, but definitely not all. And there are many different eating disorders too. There are, you know, several different ones. And there are some generalizations around like what gender draws toward one eating disorder. But I think that those generalizations can fall apart really quickly. It really, anyone can, can suffer from one, unfortunately. They're so complicated. They're extremely complicated, which is part of why I found them so interesting to work with. And it goes well beyond anorexia and bulimia, I, I think are the two most um famous ones are the most practically household names yeah uh, well binge eating goes... is the most common one. oh is it okay yeah but that one's not as um glorified in the media at least well so many of us consider ourselves binge eaters i mean i could you know i'm i'm quite thin but i consider myself a binge eater in a sense but you're talking about probably something beyond what I'm doing, which is just sitting down and gorging on a big meal. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, you know, not knowing the details of your yes, situation. We, I we, think it's we really won't do a therapy affect your life. Right now, I mean, because some people, you might have the same eating habits as somebody else, but for one person, it really causes them a lot of, a lot of difficulty and is tormenting them. Um, and for one person, it won't have that effect at all. So that, so one person might have it we would consider having a disorder and when we, we wouldn't, um, it's not just like how much do you eat in a sitting? It's, you know, a bit more, there are a lot of factors 
to it. Um, sure. What's yeah, your new I really therapy? Like how much, how much oh, is I'm it sorry. Finish that thought. I was going to say, how much, how much is it hurting your life is, is one of the first questions. Sure. What, what's your new therapy practice going to focus on? Is it going to be marriage and family or something else? Depression? I'm ready to be a little more just a generalist. I, um, I will probably still see a few people with eating disorders who are in recovery. I don't quite have the availability to see people who are really acute anymore because I, I have really unstable childcare and a variety of factors. So I'm not as available. So because of that, I need to have people who are a bit more, um, you know, can, can miss a session and be okay. Um, and I really, you know, you can imagine why I have a renewed interest in people who have struggled with infertility or pregnancy loss or postpartum issues, new parenting issues. I, I've seen a lot of clients with that. They're the same as the eating disorder clients often. Um, and that has been something that I've, you know, had more of a life course in lately. And I would, I feel drawn to working with those sorts of clients. How much does the, I mean, I, I always think of people who are fiction writers as being oftentimes they're, they're pop psychologists, let alone professionals like you, because they're very much into observation. They're very much into interaction between people and relationships and so on. Obviously your client, the, the client therapist uh, relationship is privileged, but at the same time, do you find it to be anything that feeds your fiction writing? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it doesn't feed it in as direct a way as, you know, this person's story is so fascinating. I'm going to swipe it and put a different name on them and um, pass it off as fiction. Um, it's not like that. It's more like you just hear stories all day. It's not that different than reading a lot in in an odd way. Mm -hmm. um, and people are brilliant storytellers. I mean, they, they skip over the boring parts. They go in scene and direct dialogue when the wording, exact wording of something is really crucial. And you just get the really deep stuff all day. You know, if you're lucky, I think the, the boring sessions, I'm rarely ever bored, but when I am, it's it's when people are kind of staying really superficial. And that's rare. I mean, people usually come to therapy because they want to work on stuff. And we'll just dive, dive right in. And I love that kind of conversation and connection and access to what people are really, excuse me, really going through. So it feeds my writing in that I I just be, I'm just inspired by their stories and every once in a while, like a tiny detail of, of something will make its way in, but it's, it's so twisted up with a billion other things that I can't even really trace it back. It's just like, you know, yeah. writers are inspired by any, you know, I saw a sign at a store today and like, that's going in my novel. So sometimes like that kind of little thing happens, but nothing right. that, nothing that reveals identified. identities or, no. or exact conditions or what have you. So you veered away from writing I, when you were young. It was the first thing you wanted to do is be a writer. What brought you back to the writing? I just thought that I could ignore it for long enough and it would go away. And I don't think creativity works that way. It just it, it just keeps knocking on you until you. Why were you trying to, to ignore it. it, though? Why ignore it at all? I didn't feel like it was a viable option for me. I had really low self-esteem. I didn't think, I mean, two things. One was low self-esteem. I didn't think that I could be a writer. I didn't think I was talented enough, but I also thought it's just hard in general for anyone. Um, so you have to be really special and really lucky. And I just saw that life course and I thought, I don't know that this is going to happen for me. I might just kind of take control and steer myself in another direction. And they were things, and it wasn't like I was doing things I hated. They were things that were interesting to me and more stable as jobs. So that wasn't like, you know, I went into something that I hated, but it, it wasn't satisfying the creative part of me that was only getting louder and louder and not quieter. And 
I started dating my now husband when I was in grad school for social work, like the first week. I don't think classes had actually even started. I met him. He wasn't, it was just a coincidence in the same town. He wasn't a student there. Um, and he wanted to be a writer and he was just going for it. And I found that so inspiring. And I started writing a little bit again and sharing with him and then sharing with some other people. And I just wanted to do it more and more. And, and eventually I thought, I I want to really give this a shot. I want to see if I can get into an MFA program and give it the attention that it's been wanting for so long. And if it doesn't happen for me, then it doesn't happen. But at least I, at least I tried and, you know, I love doing, I mean, it's hard, but I love to do it, you know, really dedicating part of my life to that. And I'm really, it's, I'm really glad that I did. That's a great story how you got led back to it. Now, the therapist in you, now this question might be out of bounds, but you could always take the fifth. I'm just mm -hmm. curious, the therapist in you would say you have lowest self-esteem. Why? What was it in your life? What happened in your life that you think gave you lower self-esteem than perhaps your peers? Oh, I don't know that I had exceptionally low self-esteem. I think that a lot of middle school, I mean, when I lost sight of it, I was like in middle school and high school. I think, unfortunately, lowest self-esteem is kind of the norm, uh, at least when I was growing up. I hope that's no longer as true. I feel like the next generation is like way more confident um, than mine. Um, so that's very, that's cool to see. Um, and just things like I, I didn't like school. I, I did fine, but I didn't enjoy writing and reading when I was told to read and write. Mm. Um, in fact, I hated it and I didn't do it at all. I like barely graduated. My grades were fine, but I barely graduated high school because I skipped class so much. Um, and they said, if you go to, if you skip one more class, then you can't walk at graduation. <laughs> so <laughs> it was low oh, self-esteem was definitely part of it, but it was also just like, I don't, if this is writing, like a teacher telling me to write an essay on a book I don't like, I don't enjoy that. Right. Yeah, we want control of our time and our material and all that, even as even as kids, maybe more so as kids. I mean, delaying gratification and all is something we learn along the way. And I would also say, I mean, when a person thinks in terms of writing, uh, whether nonfiction or fiction, it takes probably a good deal of self-esteem to, to say I'm good enough to do that. I think uh, probably ran into some of that as well. But you're past that now. Uh, this book is pretty self- <laughs> well, I mean, the book has been so I, ha I have my I, somewhat. I feel I feel like I've passed the point of constantly thinking like, am I talented? Am I good enough? I just I know like I am whatever I am. And I've sort of come to terms with whatever capacities I have. So my my anxieties now are not so much like, am I good enough? It's more like, is this book good enough is this chapter good enough um right and so i think a lot of that is also just getting older and just getting a little note to know yourself a bit better and so caring the, less about how what other people think <laughs> yes yes in fact you know i talk to some authors who just say you know i write for myself i don't even think about the audience it's the only way i can do it enjoyably is it's yes. me and that's yeah. it mm -hmm. now do you sit down each day when you're in writing mode and think in terms of um, just do the work. Don't worry. It, it sounds like you were leading in that direction that I'm not going to worry about my day-to-day -day output in terms of how qualitative it is, or maybe even volume. The, the, the point is sit down, do the work. Over time, it works out. Over time, you chisel away. And what emerges is a beautiful Michelangelo, ideally. <laughs> if, you're, if you're lucky. <laughs> um, I, I mean... I, like I said earlier, I have a, I have a toddler, she's two and a half now, and I finally do have daycare. It took me two years to get off a, a, a wait list, but they're closed a lot. And like today I have to pick her up earlier than I thought. So it's very, I, I can't, and I don't really want to have any more like such a strict schedule because I'm just so constantly unable to stick to it for external reasons, you know, not even it's hard enough to stick to it for internal reasons, but 
other things keep coming in the way that it's just too frustrating. So I now just write when I feel like it and when I can, and that that is kind of the only way that I have found can work uh, for me at this stage. At this stage, yeah. yeah. What's been the biggest surprise of being a mother? Motherhood has must have have had a, a surprise or two for you. What, what's been the biggest surprise? <laughs> so, so many. Um, it's funny whenever I think about motherhood, it just all these cliches come flooding into me because it's so hard to find language for things related to it. Um, I I have learned about myself that I need to write more than I ever thought. So not being able to think and read and write nearly as often as I could before my daughter was born, um, I knew would probably be tough, but I had no idea how hard that would be for me. And so the the ambition and the the need to write and the need to have alone time to think and write and do all those things, I've just been blown over by how I had no idea how crucial that was for me. So that has been one of the hardest things about motherhood is just not having as much space for that. And it's humbling in so many ways. I mean, this like the love that I feel, the anger that I feel, the sadness that I feel, the stress I feel, the joy I feel, every emotion that I had before is now just amplified um, for better or for worse. <laughs> I think right. sleep deprivation has a lot to do with that. You know, you just kind of feel more. Now, you said your husband is also a writer. So is he an internal type of guy? Does he? And the re reason I bring this up is because I think a lot of times there's a lot of stress on a mother because the child is in constant need, but the husband feels neglected. But your husband being a writer who's probably in his head a lot anyway, it, does that does that work better for you? Is that is your husband's personality such that it actually comports well better with what you need than than a typical guy might uh, who's much more external? Um, might might uh, have have filled that role. I said I tortured that in saying it, but oh, you, you understand okay. what um, I mean. Yeah, we don't have we split childcare pretty much in half, and he enjoys it. Kind of the sitting on the floor playing with blocks for four hours, like he enjoys that a lot more than I do. Um, I get really bored and really un physically uncomfortable. So he, if there's a primary attachment, it's actually to him. My daughter has to him. When I was breastfeeding, it was more for me, but you know, I, I stopped that when she was uh, under a year old. So it's been a while since it's been like that. Um, and he is, he is a writer, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say he's in his head a lot. Um, is he chatty? Is he an extrovert or an introvert? He's, he's pretty in the middle. He's, and we've talked about this a lot that I, I am very extreme introvert. Um, and he is pretty in the middle, which is a pretty nice, I have a lot of envy for him because he can tolerate a lot of alone time, but he can also tolerate a lot of time with, with people. <laughs> and I, can't as much. So there's, I mean, this is more pre COVID pre baby times, but we'd be out at a party and I would like always want to leave earlier and wish that, you know, I could have more capacity. It was more like, I wish I had more capacity rather than I wish wishing him less capacity. Mm. Um, but that's, I mean, we haven't had that situation in years at this point for a variety of factors, but he, I mean, being around your own child, this is another thing I learned, it is being around another person. So even though it's your child, and even before she had language, I would feel the drain sometimes that I feel when I'm with people for a long time. And I think, but she's my daughter, like, why is this happening? And I finally realized, well, she is another person. And I do need to be attending to her a lot. And it isn't the same as being alone. So 
I'm going to have you read an example from your book, but before I do that, I want to get into your background a little bit. You're from the Berkshires, which is Western Massachusetts, for those of you who are not familiar. Uh, you now live in Vermont, but you went to Bates College back in the day, which is a private, I looked it up, a private liberal arts college, and I've heard of it, but Lewiston, Maine is home to that, and mm -hmm. it sounds beautiful. It's anchored by the historic quad the campus of Bates totals 813 acres with a ur small urban campus, which includes 33 Victorian houses, uh, as uh, some of them serving as dormitories. And um, so it sounds like this beautiful setting. You were there studying history, uh, but you didn't take any English or creative writing courses at the time. You weren't, you weren't back on the writing path yet. What were you thinking in terms of when you were studying history? Did you have a profession in mind at that time? I was thinking about being a lawyer. Oh, that's right. Okay. But history, yeah. and you saw history as a good background for that. It did seem to be what a lot of people majored in before. I mean, that or like poli sci. Um, and I was not as interested in political science. I, I mean, really, when I look back at all the things I was studying, I was so clearly a writer you know, wearing this like fake mustache, like pretending to be something else. <laughs> I, I wanted to be a history major because of all the stories. Um, that you got to read. And I wanted to do really personal histories. I wasn't interested in more of the canonized, like, you know, presidents and things. I wanted to uh, mostly oral histories and very near past histories, like still living people and just hear their stories and, and write them basically, like write, write a short story. <laughs> so that, that I thought, oh, I can get away with, you know, my love for stories and also try to be a, a real professional lawyer. And I was very far along in some ways, I was like studying for the LSAT and taking a bunch of practice tests. And I think it was actually my parents who are lawyers. Um, they said, are you sure you really want to, to do this? Cause you just don't sound that excited mm. about it. Like, it seems like something you just should do. And I gave them a lot of credit for how they approached it because they yes. weren't dissuading me. But, oh, sorry. But they weren't <laughs> cheering you. I mean, they weren't they, trying they were pushing to get you to way. follow in their footsteps either. No, and they, weren't, they just kind of were asking, like, is this really what you want to do? And I, I think I just said no. It's and, not. They, and they had the awareness <laughs> to, to hear the lack of excitement in your voice. Yes. And, and I've and never been that out. excited about it. Yeah. So I, I applied to social work school instead. And I felt much, it still wasn't obviously creative writing, which I ended up being my, my dream, but um, it was much closer to what I would find value and joy in. Well, it's, well, still at Bates College, though, you played varsity squash, which is interesting. You are competitive <laughs> or are you not competitive? Are you just kind of physical, but not competitive? I would say I was very competitive in all ways. And that was not one of my more becoming traits. Um, I'm very, I do have some kind of stereotypical middle child tendencies. I'm an old, I have an older sister and a younger sister, and I, I would be a little too competitive in a few too many places, especially places I didn't have any skill. So it's just, you know, it's not, wasn't something I was very proud of. Squash was, and sports in general, uh, were a really good outlet for me. Cause I had, I had a lot of I just loved moving my body. I loved playing games and in very, very small ponds, like the Berkshires and Bates college, like I was good enough to be on varsity teams in a bigger pond. I know I, that probably wouldn't have happened, but I, I was very competitive. Um, I mean, I felt competitive in my, in my mind um, mm -hmm. during those years, but I really lost that. And I'm so glad that I did. I just, I don't feel competitive anymore. And I was worried that I would when my book was coming out or when it, I had a book that no one picked up a year before. Um, and I was definitely sad about it and had a lot of feelings about it, but kind of envy and competition with other people wasn't one of them. So I'm not sure what happened, but it's sort of, I sort of retired that and I just mm -hmm. don't really have the energy to be competitive anymore. It's hard enough to live your own life without being <laughs> sizing up to other people. Right, right. So you got your MFA at the uh, UC Irvine, University of California at Irvine. And 
um, you wrote three novels that you before the long answer, and you said none of them will be published. You don't see an opportunity to resuscitate those novels based on what you've learned. And um, I mean, when you look at them, are you feeling that they they're not ready for prime time, or do you uh, were they rejected by agents? Did you try to get them published? Because so oftentimes was... what happens. I was just going to say quickly, yeah. oftentimes what happens is somebody hits with a, a book like yours did and the and an agent may very well say, what else do you have? Did you already write something that we might um, move on to the front burner here? I did have one that I did go out to agents with and it wasn't picked up. I got, mo you know, mostly silence. I think most manuscripts are met with silence um, and a few encouraging rejections. And those were the people that I I wrote to first when I was sending out the long answer. So the agent I have now is one who wrote a nice uh, rejection for that novel and said something like, you know, send me, you have anything in the future? And so I, I did, <laughs> and I was lucky that he liked it. Um, but the other ones, and, and no, I don't, I don't want to resuscitate any of them because I don't, feel like they really reflect what I can, what, who the writer I am now. Mm -hmm. And I think they're, they're fine. You know, they're not, they're not terrible. Probably I haven't read them in so long, but I did read a short story of mine that when the novel, when long answer was like prepping to come out, there was that conversation of like, what else do you have that we can throw into the world? And I said, well, I have one short story that is good. It's the one short story that I have. And I wrote it. It was the first thing I wrote in my MFA program. And I had a good workshop. And I was like, I'm going to hold on to this until this exact moment <laughs> when it's time to send it, you know, send it out. And I read it over and I thought, oh, this is, this is cute, but it, you know, for a, for a first story, but it doesn't hold up. Like, I just know that I'm better now, I guess is what mm -hmm. I'm trying to say. So I don't, sure. and my agent too is like, oh, this is good, but you're better now. So I only really want to produce or put out to things in the world that I feel really like this is the best I can do at this moment in time. And I think that those are the things were the best I could do at a at moment in time, time that has yeah. passed. Yeah. And I see also see places where I was imitating other writers or, you know, not trusting myself to write a certain kind of transition or scene. I can just see all of the things I was trying. So I needed to write those novels, you know, to practice and learn. But I think that they belong in my little drawer. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. So um, when you talk, I mean, there's nothing better than looking back at writing from years ago and feeling that it's sophomoric. That Because once you, once you do that, you realize that you've gotten better. And hopefully our whole lives, we look back and and look at the previous writing. And writing, fortunately, is one of those activities or art forms that you can actually get better at with age and actually should get better at with age, uh, unlike something like dance, uh, where, you know, the body, the body deteriorates over time. It's just not possible to keep that, you know, continue to perform at a high level. So here you are now. Um, I want to ask you about what you're doing in the future, but first let's deal with the present. Let's have you read an excerpt from the long answer. I just want to, before you actually start reading, I want to uh, read just the uh, dust cover notes on it for our listeners. It goes like this, 12 weeks pregnant for the first time, Anna speaks to her sister on the other side of the country and learns she has just miscarried her second child. As this loss strains their bond and complications with Anna's own pregnancy emerge, her tenuous steps towards motherhood are shadowed and illuminated by the woman she meets, by the women she meets along the way, whose stories of the of the children they have had or longed for or lost crowd in. So an interesting readout on that. And the very first couple of sentences of the book. I'll just read that because were you going to start right from the very beginning, Anna? I can or, do, I can do that. I had one. Do you want to do later, that? But yeah, I'm happy to do that. That's easy. Okay. For context. Rather than because I thought you might be at a different part of the book. So why don't you go ahead and, and give us a, an excerpt? And I, I just want our listeners to be able to understand what your voice sounds like and as a writer. 
Sure. I'll just read the until the first space break, which is about a page and a half. The first chapter is called Elizabeth. My older sister, Margot, called me and said, you don't need to say anything, but I wanted to let you know I had a miscarriage. Just an early one, she added quickly. I'm fine now. I was more surprised than saddened. I didn't know she was pregnant or that she had been trying to get pregnant. The worst of it is over, she said. I'm relieved that I lost it when I did, before I was any further along. I only thought I was pregnant for a week. So as far as miscarriages go, this was about as easy as they get. She and Nick had quickly conceived their son, Alex, now just over a year old, and there was no reason to believe they wouldn't conceive quickly again. It was unlikely that a miscarriage would happen a second time, even though the odds were higher now than they were before. And she knew she was fertile and her body could carry a healthy pregnancy to term. They just had to wait for one cycle to try to conceive again. There wasn't anything more to say, she said. She'd just rather I hear it from her than from her mother. And she wanted to make sure that I would still feel able to talk to her about my pregnancy. I was nine weeks when she called. She had been hesitant to tell me any of this for fear that I would shield her from it, which was exactly what she didn't want. Truly, she said, I only feel happiness for you. Please know that. How are you feeling, anyway? Any better at all? I wasn't sure if I should call her after that, if the miscarriage was something she wanted to talk more about, despite saying she did not. I was surprised she told me at all. We'd never been the kind of sisters who tell each other our most vulnerable secrets, and since this dynamic had always felt more like her choice than mine, I tried to honor it. In the, following, in the days following, I sent her text saying, how are you feeling? Please let me know if there's anything I can do. And Isaac and I bought her a $50 gift certificate to Moose's Tooth Pizzeria. Her responses were curt, doing okay today, thanks, or you're sweet, but I'm fine. Soon she only replied with an emoji of a flower bouquet or a yellow heart. When my last text, just letting you know I'm thinking of you, went unanswered, I decided to let her be the one to initiate contact next, whenever that would be. You know, and the reason I was going to read those first few sentences, uh, if you weren't going to do it, is that right off the bat, you establish this relationship or this kind of lack of relationship between sisters. And I think you really kind of set things up right away uh, in a, in a way that draws readers in and also a, a way that a lot of people can identify with because they've got, if you've got more than say one sibling, or even if you've got one sibling, it, it's the sort of thing where oftentimes our relationships with our siblings aren't that great. And uh, even from a male perspective, it, you know, a guy like me can read that and understand that, you know, I might have a brother that I feel that way about. And the major event in her life and um, you only find out about it after the fact and and so on what inspired you to write this i mean can you answer that question without feeling that you're giving something away that that you'd rather keep close to the best oh no i'm happy to talk about it i was pregnant with my first pregnancy when i began to write it and i just i really wanted to hear stories of how people had survived pregnancy, normal, healthy pregnancy. So not even, you know, complications or losses of any kind, just, just being pregnant and having things go well for me was just, I was humbled by, I mean, the, the um, emotions being heightened that I was speaking of earlier about motherhood started with pregnancy or even with trying to get pregnant. It, it wasn't something that just happened the day that my daughter was born. And I just felt totally in deep, you know, in over my head, emotion wise, and thought, well, this happens every day all over the world for since the human race has been in existence. Uh, I would really like to hear from some of these people just how they get through this time in their life that is usually just glossed over when people just say, oh, then I had kids or then I got pregnant and blah, blah. It's, there's never, I always want to like pause there and like zoom in and be like, what was it really like for you? And how long did you try? And what was your pregnancy? Like, I just kind of want to know the gory details because I'm nosy, but also because I was trying to understand how to get through the day. And I wanted to know how other people got through the day during that time. So that was when I initially set out to write it. And then I was, I'd written most of the first chapter 
and had ideas about the rest of it when I lost the pregnancy that I was carrying that had been to my knowledge, healthy and fine. Um, but at 20 week anatomy scan, so about five months learned that he had a really severe heart defect and wouldn't survive after birth. And so we had an abortion. It seemed like really the only option, merciful option. And it became a very different, well, not a very different book. I mean, the, the themes all of a sudden seemed too, too relevant to me because um, there had already been paths interrupted in the book for almost every other character except for the Anna character. So it almost was like teed up for this to happen, you know, literally not in life. Um, and so I just kept writing it, but with this new, new focus on not just how do people get through this time in their life, but what happens when there's an interruption or a tragic interruption or a loss and it not just pregnancy loss, there are lots of different kinds of uh, different courses that life's taken this book, obviously pregnancy loss is a, a theme, but um, so my question wasn't just how do people get through the day, it's how do they survive these alterations to what they thought was going to happen and continue on and create a new story of their lives was something that I became desperate to understand. And so I started writing with that renewed focus and, and stories that were really helping me um, at that time ended up being in the book. Ones that I you know made up, <laughs> stories that I was telling myself that were helping me made it into the book. Right, right. So you obviously wanted to have a child. Uh, you you needed to, I mean, the main route at that point, as you say, was to abort the pregnancy because of the defect. Uh, so what was your reaction to when you heard the Dobbs decision that um, Roe v. Wade had been had been re repealed? Uh, I mean, it was such a tiered realization because you know this has been a long time coming like we never took it for granted really you know even from the 70s but then like Trump is elected then Ruth Bader Ginsburg passes away and then it's leaked and then it actually happens so with each one of those you know oh this it's getting closer and closer I would just feel tired and and wanting to just kind of plug my ears to it to be honest I just because they felt so out of my control and they are so out of my control. They're so much bigger than me, these decisions and the systems that are creating them that I just wanted to not engage at all. And the pain of what this meant to women in my position, I mean, in so many other positions as well, but you know, the one I could most easily imagine was, was my position just was overwhelmingly sad to me and made me really, really angry. Hmm. Um, yeah. A common reaction for sure. Yeah. And I still feel those feelings, you know, they're not, it's still happening. You know, the decision was made, but I have decided I've become a slightly different writer since writing this book where I'm now more interested in fiction. I'm still writing novel, but I'm also interested in essays. And I found that the thoughts I was having about Dobbs, I didn't belong in my novel as heavy handedly as I wanted to write about them. So I started writing some essays about it to kind of, you know, have a, a outlet for those. And then my novel, I, I think all of those things are in there. It's just, um, you know, hopefully not beating you over the head with it. Right. You don't want to sound preachy or, uh, um, although I've, I've read <laughs> novelists who do plenty of preaching yes. with the writing, <laughs> but that it's really not, artistic to do it that way. So um, interesting. So when you are sitting to write, what do you concentrate on while writing? I mean, I understand you concentrate on the story and you're trying to develop that story, but are there certain elements to writing that are a, an element to writing that you particularly concentrate on while you're there? Or maybe there's even a mantra or some kind of incantation that you repeat to yourself to keep yourself focused on uh properly focused while you while you're doing this because our mm -hmm. minds tend 
tend to stray, especially when we're getting frustrated. So I'm curious what what you can offer on that. It's kind of an open-ended question. Well, my mind strays, I mean, all the time. I just, I feel like I've, any attention span I had uh, before I had my baby is just completely shot. And so I'm like checking my email, I'm checking my social media, I'm getting up to get a snack that I don't need. I'm not, you know, (laughs) the most disciplined at all. And I used to really beat myself up about it. And now I just realize that that's just part of my process, even if it looks totally inefficient to anyone else, like writing for 30 seconds and then writing it, watching a YouTube clip and then going back to the writing is like just how I get stuff on the page. Um, It's not great, but it's kind of just what it is at this point. I don't have a mantra. That sounds like a nice thing that I would be cool to have, but I to answer your question about what I'm focusing on these days, I would say it's momentum. And I say these days, meaning the last Mm. starting the long answer and what I'm writing now, everything I've written since then has been momentum and, and just wanting to feel a sense of engrossing and, and movement. Whereas when I was younger writer or a more insecure writer, Um, my focus was much more on the sentence and making sentences that would show that I'm good and smart and all the things that I was worried I wasn't. And I think I've, I still care about sentences for sure, but I used to write like, okay, I need a beautiful sentence, beautiful sentence, beautiful sentence, and then stop and turn in the piece and it would lack momentum. It would have mm. maybe some purity sentences, but nothing else. Yeah. And now I just really focus on momentum and the story structure. And I just trust, okay, later I can make these sentences pretty, but they they almost can't be too nice because then they distract from the story, which is why we're all here is for the story. Yeah. You know, that's, it's interesting you make that point. You know, I think back to the therapy sessions where you, where you were saying your clients would tell stories and there are interesting stories because they dispense with the, I mean, they, they cut to the chase. Yeah. So there's momentum in their storytelling. You discovered a way to bring momentum to your storytelling. And uh, I think a lot of novels, I'm very picky with what I read. And I think a lot of them lack momentum uh, for the very reason you're talking about. They go down to the sentence level and they create maybe well-structured, sometimes complicated sentences at the expense of momentum. Is momentum important to you from your own uh, to keep you engaged? Or do you feel that it's important that you're not going to keep a reader engaged unless you've got it? They've got a real sense of of, um, forward advancement. Oh, I need it. Yeah. Especially now that I'm just so tired. Um, I, I started reading a lot more upmarket things when my daughter was really young. I would just listen to them on audio um, just because I needed to stay awake and I wasn't, I didn't think I was reading as a writer. I thought I was kind of taking a break from that, but I don't think I could ever fully take a break from it. So they kind of got into my brain um, more than I realized they would. And I, I mean, momentum, it doesn't always mean fast momentum. I think it just means you need to feel like you're in a current that's going the right pace. And of course that's like impossible to determine, but you know it when you feel it. So I think books that are where I can see the effort to try to be so fast and so catchy, and there's something huge happening on every page. I might feel like this is actually like pushing me too fast. Like I, I feel like I'm not being cared for. Um, so those are the questions I'm asking myself now. Like, am I, did I just, am, am I bored? So I'm rushing if I'm bored, the reader's going to be bored. That's just kind of, I accept that as a gospel. So Mm -hmm. if I'm not going to write anything that I'm bored by and just hope that readers will, will be interested in what I'm interested in. So I might spend, you know, a whole page on a really small exchange between two people, like a, a moment in time. And then I have a sentence that's like 10 years later, they saw each other again. And it, oh my God, it feels so good to write a sentence like that. It's something (laughs) I would not have allowed myself, but it's like, what happened in those 10 years? Another story might find those important, but the story that I'm trying to tell right now, those 10 years, we don't need them. So I'm just skipping 
yes. skipping over them. And that's a challenge. I mean, it was always a challenge for me. I always felt, felt like I needed to fill in blanks instead of just making that leap forward. And th- then you see it done to extremes by a guy like Sidney Sheldon, where he'll he'll leap a generation in a chapter. Uh, but that's pop, you know, it's pop um, fiction versus um, what you're doing, which is uh, because there's a lot of momentum in in a lot of popular fiction, but there's not a lot of really good sentence structure or necessarily good character development and so on. So oh, there is that all. balance. I mean, that's why it's exactly. so hard. You need good sentences. You need momentum. You need character development. You need to forget that you're reading a book. You need to just have it all appear so effortlessly that you're just riding along. And um, yeah, you need all of it. I think I just, I find myself focusing on certain things that I need need to work on more while I feel like I'm getting stronger in other areas and not thinking about them as consciously. Well, and you make a good point that it doesn't, momentum doesn't mean that you have to you know, be doing whitewater rapids. It could be just a, a, a stream that you're floating down. Yeah. So yeah. it's movement. There's mm-hmm. movement there, but it doesn't have to be necessarily rapid movement unless the situation truly calls for it. What are you working on now, Anna? You're doing personal essays. You were saying that, um, you know, nonfiction essays where you can um, state your thoughts forcefully, maybe even politically and so on. Uh, Do you have another book in the works? I do. And I'm afraid to, I'm going to like scare it away by talking about it out loud, but um, I don't really believe that. So I'll talk about it anyway. (laughs) Uh, I, I think I'm almost done with a working draft of a new novel and that I've somehow found little scraps of time and attention to give over the past uh, couple of years. And I'm, but when I feel this thought that is outside the realms of the novel really bubbling up and I'm thinking about it all the time, then I just, I just write an essay about it and it takes a couple of days and then I go back to my novel. So I'm sort of doing, doing both. And I really love doing both. Um, they're satisfying to different parts of me, kind of the short game, the essay you can hold in your hand and to have it done quickly. And that is really satisfying. And a novel is obviously not that. So they're, they're both, um, I love having them both in my mind when, when I can. And I don't know when the novel will be done, done, but I feel like I've, I've found its shape. And that to me has been really really hard. Um, the long answer, I mean, writing is always difficult, but the long answer form and the stories in it came to me, um, really forcefully. And I think part of it was just the grief I was feeling. I had such an intense vision for it. And this next book I've been in a better place in life, thankfully. Um, so the intensity of the need has been lesser. So it's been, um, it's interesting. It's, you don't get, get, writing a novel doesn't get easier. You just, you always have a new novel in front of you that is its own challenges. So finding the shape of this new one has been um, really hard, but I think I finally figured it out. Now, is it a, a stark departure from the long answer? Or do you feel like somebody reading your next one would say, I, I hear the, I hear that voice. I see that storytelling style. Will there be a familiarity there? I, I, my hope is that there will be a familiarity that be like, oh, this, this is the same writer. Um, but that it's not the same. It's not the same book at all. I mean, there's some, there's some themes that I think I'll always be interested in that will probably pop up in, I mean, just family making and things not going according to plan is sort of something I, and that's sort of what a lot of novels do. But I think that I found a tone that I enjoy writing in that is pretty similar to Long Answer, but uh, there's a lot different. There's like a whole part that's like in the 1950s and then it goes back to present and it's it's a little more um, variable in some ways. Anna, I know you're pressed for time, uh, always pressed for time. I know you're pressed for time today because you got to pick your daughter up. I really appreciate you uh, taking an hour out of your day and visiting with me. Thank you for coming on the program and I wish you best of luck with your next project. Thank you so much. I was enjoying our conversation. I lost track of time and I didn't realize that I am <laughs> I'm running late. So thank you for reminding me. Um, thank you. And um, I look forward to listening to more episodes of your show.